On this episode of Cape Media News, the Cape Cod Commission is looking at Cape Cod's housing shortage. Good news for fans of off-roading at Sandy Neck and the annual spring rabies baiting is taking place now. These stories and more, this is Cape Media News. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Colvin and this is Cape Media News, your local authentic newscast for Cape Cod. The Department of Developmental Services Citizens Advisory Board held its annual recognition breakfast this morning. Cape Media News was there. Over 150 people gathered at the Department of Development Services Citizen Advisory Board recognition breakfast in Centerville this morning honoring individuals with disabilities and the caregivers who support them every day. So I extend my deeply felt appreciation for the work that today's recipients have done and the individuals whose lives they've enriched. The Cape and Islands delegation gave awards to caregivers and participants from the Arc of Cape Cod, Cape Abilities, Community Connections, and several others. The work that these agencies are doing, uh, many times with tight budgets, um, but really uh, with a heart, with a heart that has no deficit. And the work that they're doing throughout the community, we were able this year in the, in the state budget to, along with the governor's leadership at the beginning of the budget process, to fully fund the Turning 22 program and to put more money into the DDS budget than we had in years past. It's a wonderful time to come together, the advisory board members of the Department of Developmental Services, all of whom are parents select the awardees and it means that these are services that truly make a difference for people. Artwork from many of the individuals were displayed during the breakfast and on the cover of this year's program. The Department of Developmental Services is dedicated to creating innovative and genuine opportunities for individuals with intellectual disabilities to participate fully and meaningfully and to contrib contribute to their communities as valued members. Up next, the Cape Cod Commission wants you to weigh in on the housing gap. Hi, I'm Garrett Jansen. I'm an AmeriCorps Cape Cod member and I'm here at the Harwich Community Center where I hope you'll join me on Saturday, April 29th for our third annual Tour de Trash. The Town of Harwich, the Harwich Conservation Trust, and AmeriCorps Cape Cod will all be here, helping to organize our dozens of volunteers to gather into groups, go out through the streets of Harwich, and pick up trash. For more information and to pre-register, please visit our website, harwichconservationtrust.org. We're meeting here at 9.30, where you'll receive your handy pickers, vests, and garbage bags, and then taking to the streets. Lunch will be served at noon. We look forward to seeing you, and we very much look forward to seeing the Harwich streets clean and litter-free. Thank you. We'd like to thank our dedicated volunteers, especially Dave Callahan and Nancy Hip, who founded this event three years ago, as well as our partners, the Town of Harwich and the Harwich Conservation Trust, and our donors, Stop and Shop, the Nauset Disposal Company, and the Hot Stove Saloon. Thank you so much, everyone, for your generous contributions and labor. The Cape Cod Commission will soon embark on a study to examine the housing situation on Cape Cod in hopes of identifying gaps and working towards solutions. The study is being conducted by Crane Associates and Economic and Policy Resources Incorporated. It'll take a look at the Upper Cape, Mid Cape, Lower Cape and Outer Cape to show the housing options available for a range of income levels, gaps that exist and the demand. Public input will be heard at a series of meetings scheduled for this week. Wednesday, May 3rd at 1.30 at the Chatham Community Center or Wednesday, May 3rd at 6 at the Cape Cod Commission headquarters. Thursday, May 4th at Mashpee Town Hall at 9 a.m. Also Thursday, May 4th at the Wellfleet Library at 2.30. Honors for a Cape Cod Community College professor, Nancy Willits, was recognized by the Eastern Communication Association with its Distinguished Teaching Fellows recognition. The Teaching Fellows program recognizes a distinguished career of teaching excellence in the field of communication. It's limited to colleagues who have active and ongoing service to the ECA. College President John Cox praised Willits for her high academic achievement and recognition by her peers. 
Our students' greatest resource here, he says, are the highly skilled and very knowledgeable faculty who are deeply committed to their success. Professor Willett's recognition also shows how committed our faculty are to excellence in their own disciplines. Willits has been asked by the current president of the National Communication Association to lead a task force on community colleges and their impact on the communications discipline. Willits is a past president of the Eastern Communication Association. Good news for off-roaders who like to enjoy Sandy Neck Beach Park in the warm summer days. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts has obtained a federal Section 10 permit that will allow limited plover and turn takes, enabling towns to increase off-road vehicle access. Sandy Neck again is included in this program. The measure should mean less closures during plover nesting and fledging season, which at times has severely limited off-road access to the beach. I caught up with Sandy Neck Beach Park Manager Nina Coleman. I don't think there's going to be a complete closure if we have this permit in place and we have the permit for three years. We have uh, piping plovers on, on uh, Sandy Neck and all our Cape Cod beaches. That's a federally endangered or threatened species. They're listed as threatened. And so those birds are globally rare. Eggs will start uh, being laid in probably this weekend. So usually um, by May 1st we have at least one nest. So they'll nest through May. The problem is that the nests get predated, so then they try again, and that's when the season just drags on and on and on. We have to protect the plovers while they're going through their nesting, um, and then once the chicks hatch, we have to close the beach to off-road vehicles. And um, so we're at the whim of where these birds put their nests, and that's a, that's a real issue. Now, generally speaking, in most situations, uh, piping plover chicks and pedestrian traffic or beach going traffic um, is compatible if you manage it. But certainly vehicles, the chicks are right in the track. You couldn't have set up a worse scenario. Like they are in the track, they cannot fly. Um, they freeze uh, when their parent tells them that they're in danger. So the parent will, you know, will call out and they'll freeze right in the track. And so I know they wouldn't survive. Um, and and this, you know, that's why this closure, these closures occur. The exciting news is we did receive a, an inclusion into the Section 10 permit. Um, and what that means is that we uh, are actually getting insurance that we're not gonna have a beach closure. That's always been the biggest and most difficult part of managing this beach is those full beach closures. They've only occurred a few times, but when they occur, it is a big deal. We lose revenue. We don't wanna stop the birds from having the opportunity to, to nest that year, but we wanna suggest to them where to nest, if that makes sense. So that first section of beach, where there is a pair that often pokes around and considers nesting, when they start coming in and poking around, we, we rake. We uh, make sure the fencing is such that vehicles are going through that area. Uh, we could even put plywood down if there's some really tempting habitat. So we're gently suggesting really early on in their nesting, you know, way prior to eggs, we're just suggesting that maybe the other, you know, 4,000 acres of beach here is a good spot for them to go. And that, that does require a Section 10 permit. The second part of our permit has to do with turns. So turn, the turn colony, as people who are on Sandy Neck know, we stay at a mile and a half late into the year, past Labor Day sometimes, and the beach is very, very densely packed, and people don't like that. I don't like it, it's not safe. Um, and what that is is late nesting turns. So we've actually included in our permit the opportunity to um, escort late in the season, August into September, some, uh, some vehicles, self-contained vehicles past that and reduce the congestion on the rest of the beach. So that's, that's the start of this permit. It's an open permit, it's um, amendable, we can amend it. So if, uh, if mother nature throws us a curveball, we could try to address it, but we have got all of the, the pieces in, in place to be able to uh, go with the flow every year. There's, there will be no complete closure. That doesn't mean that the beach is going to be, you know, the whole beach is not going to be open. We will still have less beach in the summer. That's not going to change, but it's, again, it's the insurance. It's the, the knowledge that we will be able to provide off-road vehicle use at some level all summer is really what the goal was. Anyone with a four-wheel or all-wheel drive vehicle may obtain an off-road permit for Sandy Neck Beach Park. 
The spring round of rabies baiting is underway. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is hand baiting off Cape this week. They'll begin to fill bait stations next week. Brian Bjorklund is a wildlife and rabies biologist that leads the program. Distributing rabies vaccine baits to vaccinate uh, wildlife, specifically raccoons, coyotes, foxes, and other um, small carnivores uh, against rabies to strengthen the barrier for the reintroduction of rabies to Cape Cod. This event uh, occurs twice per year, uh, once in the spring, which we're in the middle of right now, and then once again in the fall. So the Cape Cod rabies program started in 1994 as a result of rabies first being discovered in Massachusetts in 1992. The program was set up to protect Cape Cod against uh, the introduction of rabies to the Cape. Unfortunately, in 2004, there was a, a case of raccoon rabies east of the canal in uh, Bourne and then Falmouth, and then by 2006, it had spread all the way to Provincetown, despite our best efforts to prevent the spread that far. Since then, we've been trying to push that barrier back towards the canal, and we have not had a case of raccoon variant rabies since 2013. So beginning last spring, we set up the mainland zone once again that we had been baiting prior to the breach in 2004. Uh, inside is a little sachet that when the raccoon or other species comes across it, they'll bite through that bait, which is a fish meal, and puncture that sachet on the inside, which would spray the vaccine onto their gums, and they'll be vaccinated in that manner. Uh, the other format, um, it's called the, the coda sachet. Uh, it's it's pretty much what's on the inside of the fish meal polymer, but it has a more flaky fish meal on the outside, and that's going to be used on the cape um, in addition to the fish meal blocks. The baits are not harmful to your pets. Um, we do receive you know, a number of phone calls about people whose dogs come across the baits, um, and they're concerned about what they are, uh, but they're not harmful to your pets. If your dog were to consume a bunch of these baits, he, he or she may experience an upset stomach from the, you know, the, that richness of that the fish meal bait itself. Generally, they don't pose any risk to people unless you're uh, immunocompromised or uh, have a, you know, a skin uh, condition or pregnant. Uh, if that's the case, then we urge them to call the State Department of Public Health. Coming up, we'll tell you how to help clean up your community. Yarmouth is asking residents for support this Saturday. Which is, you know, one of the highlights was the, and I had uh, this in my mind when I first met with you, was there was that very famous concert on November 13th of 1961 when uh, Jackie and President Kennedy wanted to introduce and highlight the arts. Yes. And it was a big part of their life. So they had that very formal evening. Mm -hmm. and they, the night Casals played was kind of the headline. Pablo Casals, a world Casals. famous cellist. But yes. the pieces are legendary. The concert is legendary. You talk about Casals and people talk about that night in, uh, in our history. And to have uh, you uh, bring Amit Paled right. with that cello. Yes, uh, yes. Which is, this is the second year he's had that on loan. Right. If I heard from you right. And we'll have a chance to hear that cello. That's the world's most famous cello. Yeah, I, I, it, well, it, 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 because it, it was in the hands of the most famous cellist. Right. Uh, Pablo Casals, and what an incredible opportunity to, to hear this young man play the same cello that was at the White House, and he's going to be playing one of the songs that Casals played for the Kennedys uh, at, at, that, at that historic evening. It's going to be, and that's just one of a whole right. panorama of, of entertainment. We're going to be performing Camelot, the title song from the new musical, wow. Camelot. And because w that was evidently one of JFK's favorite albums to play at the it White was. House, but it was, it was because it was representative of a very idealistic time. You know, there, there once was a kingdom. You know, and and that kind of optimism, I think, he wanted to bring to his own presidency. And then we have um, some other. Uh, we have we can play some music of Apollo 13 during under the space race uh, images of the you know the Apollo mission. Um, we're going to be performing a work by Leonard Bernstein. Uh, a fanfare he wrote for the inauguration of JFK, right. which is so rarely performed. It's a, it's a fun overture by the great. And of course, Bernstein wrote a piece for the opening of the Kennedy Center, right. uh, you know, performing arts center. And so th that whole tie-in is going to all be richly put together for the evening.
You can join with your friends, family and neighbors to celebrate Earth Day and to give the town of Yarmouth a thorough spring cleaning happening April 29th. Meet at Yarmouth Town Hall on Route 28 in South Yarmouth at 9 o'clock Saturday morning for your route assignment. A free volunteer appreciation lunch follows the cleanup. If you want to wear comfortable footwear and clothing, bring gloves if you have them. Other supplies will be provided. You can register at YarmouthCapeCod.com. You can join us Monday for a brand new edition of Cape Media News. Stay up to date online at capemedia.org. I'm Sarah Colvin.